erectile dysfunction is an interesting process, and uh, it's changed over the years. Um, I trained down at Indiana University, which is a big urological cancer center, and we treated lots of prostate and bladder cancer and things like that, and we created a lot of erectile dysfunction. And Dr. Donahue, who, who was the, the chairman of the department at that time, really stressed to us that one of the things that we, one of our responsibilities was to treat the side effects of our treatments. And I saw a lot of patients with erectile dysfunction due to prostate cancer and bladder cancer, as well as other reasons. Um, and one of the things that attracted me to this topic was the fact that you treat these patients and they're incredibly happy and, and, and grateful. So um, erectile dysfunction is one of those, those things that I do and the way our group is set up, we can do the things we want to do. I don't have to do, I don't have to be a jack of all trades. Dr. Traver does prostate cancer and the robotic surgery. Um, I do erectile dysfunction and reconstruction. So the group here really has is, is, is helped me from this standpoint. Um, so erectile dysfunction, um, it, it really isn't a simply just a lifestyle issue. Erectile dysfunction is a disease process, just like high blood pressure or high cholesterol uh, or cancer. It's, it's a disease process, and I think that's changed over, over the years. People initially thought, well, it's just a lifestyle issue. It's not that big a deal. It is a big deal, and knowing that you have erectile dysfunction is important because evaluating you and treating you um, is, uh, is, is very straightforward, and, and, and it can tip us off to some other, other medical issues. In the last 10 years, we've really uh, come to understand the importance and the significance of the disease process. What we know is that erectile dysfunction can be a sign of other potentially significant diseases. And 10 years ago, we really didn't take, uh, take note of that. So what are the key concepts? Um, number one, ex expanding incidence. What, basically what I mean is that I'm seeing more and more patients with erectile dysfunction. Um, 15,000 people, people a day turn 50. We're seeing this, this explosion of the baby boomers. We're seeing more people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. So I'm going to see more erectile dysfunction because patients, as they age, are troubled with erectile dysfunction. Early diagnosis is a key. Uh, the, the, the earlier we see patients with erectile dysfunction, the more effective I can be in treating them. In addition, um, it can tip me off to other things. I see patients who come in complaining of erectile dysfunction, and we diagnose blood vessel disease and diabetes and high blood pressure and cholesterol issues. So early diagnosis is very important. Um, as you heard earlier, it, it is an, it, an endothelial dysfunction. It's a vascular disease. Blood doesn't get to where it needs to get to. Um, exercise and diet are very important. When we talk about treatment of erectile dysfunction, one of the mainstays of treatment is, is exercise and diet. And exercise and diet can prevent further problems, and it can be an effective treatment, believe it or not. There are effective drugs, and we know that. We just, you see the commercials all the time. Um, drug therapy can be, can, can be very effective. If drugs don't work, or they're too expensive, or they have too many side effects, there are other options as well. And we know that with erectile dysfunction, there is a risk of early death. And that's not just a, a, an outlandish statement. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's the truth. And that's the mainstay of this talk today. So let's look at some common facts. 40% of men in, their four, in the age of 40 to 70 are going to have problems with erectile dysfunction. That's a, that, that's a significant number. We know that the risk rises significantly with age. We know that four times as many people in their 50s have erectile dysfunction as, as people in their 20s. Um, over 600,000 new cases are diagnosed annually. Um, 600,000 isn't the correct number, though. It's probably closer to a million. It's a common disease getting more common. And the question is, how many undiagnosed cases are there? I'm sure there's many more than that. It's, it's such a common disease, and with those baby boomers getting more prevalent in our population, we're going to see more and more cases. So what's the definition of erectile dysfunction? Erectile dysfunction is the inability to get and maintain an erection to complete sexual intercourse to the satisfaction of both partners. It's a couple's disease. So when I see patients with erectile dysfunction in my office, my preference is to see couples not just the male. It's much better, much more effective from, a, from the standpoint of evaluation and treatment to see couples. And uh, I'm, I'm much happier when I see both, both partners in the office. 
So normal erect, uh, erectile function requires three things. It's, blood's got to get to the penis and it's got to stay there. The nerves have to function that go to the penis and there's got to be normal hormonal function. Um, newer research is now looking at, at central nervous system uh, neurotransmitters and that's an area of, of intense research these days. And it's probably going to open up the door for more pharmaceutical um, and drug treatment options. What we know is that most erectile dysfunction is due to a blood flow issue. Either blood's not getting to the penis or it's not staying there. So blood flow is number one. And the key blood flow vessel that I see that, that affects or compromises erectile function is the internal pudendal artery. I'm just going to step over here real quick. Uh, the internal pudendal artery, which should be right here, is this little blood vessel right down there. So what happens is that we've got a big blood vessel called the aorta. And the aorta splits into two larger blood vessels, which are, are smaller blood vessels, and splits into two smaller blood vessels furthermore. And there are two small blood vessels that go to each side of the penis. Um, about in, in the mid-80s, uh, there was a study done in Europe that looked at vascular anatomy. And we found that about 30% of patients probably didn't have two internal pudendal arteries. Um, more recently, we've seen some more elegant studies, and with the help of robotic surgery, we found that um, that number is probably higher than that. So two blood vessels at each side of the penis is key, but we see a lot of patients that probably don't have two, two blood vessels. And that's going to compromise blood flow. And once that compromises blood flow to the penis, uh, there's going to be problems with keeping that blood in the penis. One of the, uh, one of the things that we don't understand is that if blood's not getting there, one of the adaptive mechanisms is that there's an increase in the number and the size of the blood vessels that drain the penis. Um, and that kind of focuses on difficulty maintaining an erection, which is a, a, a big problem. When guys come to me and say they can get the erection, but then they can't maintain it, that's a big problem. So what about nerve function? That's the second thing that's important. We have a system, a system in, our, our nerve function called, in our nervous system called the parasympathetic nerves. These are located deep in the pelvis, and they course between the prostate and the rectum. And they're these fine, delicate nerves. Uh, they're better visualized with robotic surgery during prostate removal. When we used to do prostate removal with an incision, we'd sort of, for lack of better terms, kind of dig around in the pelvis, and it was very difficult to see these, these, these nerves. Uh, with robotic surgery, uh, there's much less blood, blood loss. We can see these nerves much more effectively. Um, and, and we can spare those nerves. So theoretically, we're going to preserve uh, erectile function in patients uh, who, who are having their prostates removed with robotic surgery. Uh, radiation therapy to the pelvis, be it for prostate cancer, bladder cancer, rectal cancer, any of those are going to damage those fine and delicate nerves. And also we know that, that diabetes will irreversibly damage these, these nerves. That's why many patients that I see in the office with erectile dysfunction uh, have diabetes. And diabetes is a big problem when it comes to the nerves that, that, that go into the, uh, through the pelvis into the penis. And what about hormonal function? You just heard Dr. Traver talk about testosterone and, and hormonal function. It's really been a poorly studied part of, of, of healthcare, I think. Um, it, this has expanded five years ago, and part of this has been that, that the drug companies have become involved and it's become a moneymaker for them. But the flip side is that low testosterone has, can have significant uh, uh, issues as far as your overall health, as we've talked about, as Dr. Traver talked about. There is lots of misinformation. The treatment options are somewhat limited now, although there's a brand new form of uh, testosterone therapy, that, that, that an injectable form that's coming out that's mu much longer acting. So that, that, that's going to help patients enormously. Uh, we know that, that uh, testosterone and testosterone therapy can play a key role in uh, overall health as well as sexual function. Um, so let's look at hormonal function again. It really promotes vascular health. That's one of the key things. And, and, and like I said before, vascular issues, blood flow issues are a, a mainstay when it comes to erectile dysfunction. It also prom promotes bone and muscle health. We know that mental and sexual health, uh, sexual health meaning a libido. So how do we evaluate erectile dysfunction? When somebody comes to me and, and says, I have difficulty getting an erection or maintaining an erection, what's the evaluation? It's pretty simple. 
first and foremost, it's a history, talking to you, sitting down and talking to you. That's, that, that, that is absolutely key. If you don't ask me, I should ask you. And in these days where we're pushing patients through and seeing lots of patients and we, we practice somewhat what, what I call factory medicine, maybe erectile dysfunction gets put on the back burner. And it probably shouldn't be put on the back burner. It's something that we should talk about but you have to be your own advocate. You've got to say something to me, and I think that's incredibly important. But I need to be an advocate for you as well. So when you come to me and talk to me about your prostate or about your urinary issues or about kidney stones or any urological problem, I should talk to you about erectile dysfunction. And unfortunately, we don't always have the time to do that. So what are the treatment options for patients with erectile dysfunction? First and foremost is edu education. I've got to sit down and talk to you about it. I've got to talk to you about why you have erectile dysfunction, what normal erectile function is, and, and, and educate you on that aspect of things. That's my job, first and foremost. Uh, behavior changes, lifestyle changes are incredibly important. Good dietary habits, exercise, stress reduction, good sleep habits, all of those are incredibly important. You know, if you look at the dietary changes that have occurred in the last 20 years, the rates of obesity are going up. Uh, we're eating fast food, we're eating processed food, we're eating high fructose corn syrup. All of that promotes things like diabetes and, and, and blood vessel issues and, and uh, um, a, a, a host of other issues. So talking about diet is, I, I think, very important. It's something that we shouldn't skip. And we shouldn't just move to Viagra or Levitra or the, the penile injections or the internal pump or, or something along those lines. We need to talk about diet first and foremost. With that being said, I think medications are, are incredibly important and incredibly uh, effective. Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, uh, Staxin, and Stendra. There's, there, there, there's now five good medications out there. And I think the biggest issue with these medications, along with efficacy and side effect, is cost. These medications are not cheap. You know, right now we're looking at $30 a pill for these medications in many cases. Um, and in most insurance plans, Insurance plans are not paying for these medications. So medications are an option. They may not be the, the best option for an individual patient. Uh, what about the external pump? The external pump is a simple process. It's an essentially a tube that's put on the penis, and you pump it. It pulls blood into the penis, and then you have to put, put a constriction band around the base of the penis. It's very simple to use. I think one of the biggest downsides of the external pump is that patients aren't taught correctly how to use it. They're frustrated, and it creates pain. Uh, and they, you know, as one guy had showed me the pieces of his external pump, he threw it against the wall. So the external pump is a good option. I do think that, uh, that, that patients have to be instructed on how to use this effectively. Uh, penile injections, that's where you take a needle and a syringe, inject the side of your penis, is a very effective option. And the penile injections are not painful. They're easy to use. Most patients can do this if they're taught correctly. There are some downsides. You have to do it, and there is the risk of a prolonged erection. But many patients respond very well to penile injection therapy, and the side effects are, are fairly minimal. And then there's the internal pump. The internal pump is a device that I put inside of you. And I think that if you look at patients who've had internal pump as, the, as a treatment for their erectile dysfunction, it's a definitive treatment. It's the end point. They, they, they can get an erection whenever they want. They can get an erection for 10 minutes, for two hours, three times a day, once a week, once a month. It can be very effective. And if you look at the, um, the patient partner satisfaction rates, they're extremely high. 90% 90, 90 of patients would, would recommend it to others or do it again. So the pump is, is, is very effective. I do think that you have to pick and choose patients appropriately when you talk about the internal pump. I don't think it's a, it's a good option for everybody. Um, otherwise, we do them all day long. Um, it's, it, it's a good option for the correct patient. And if I pick and choose my patients appropriately and counsel them appropriately, I think the success rates go higher and higher. Now, one of the, one of the key questions, when I talk about success rates of the internal pump, and I talk about a 90% success rate, the real question is, why isn't it 100%? What is it, why do 10% of patients, why aren't they successful? Why, why, is it, why wouldn't they recommend it to others? Why wouldn't they do it again? And I think there are two key issues there. The internal pump is a prosthetic device. So 
it, it, there is the risk of an infection. And when we put the internal pump in here at Holland Hospital, um, we're very meticulous. I work with the same two people each time. We can put it in in about 30 to 45 minutes, uh, and that drops our infection rate significantly. We can go from uh, the standards about one in 100 patients get an infection. Our infection rate is one in 400, simply because we do a lot of them and we, we, we have a good system and it, and, and it works well. Um, the, other, the other thing that, that, that contributes to that 10% is penile length. Penile length is, a, is an important issue. Uh, sometimes it's overstated, and sometimes we don't, we, we, we don't appreciate it enough. Uh, patients that have had their prostates removed will frequently have problems with, with uh, penile length-related issues. People with low testosterone over a long period of time will have penile length-related issues. Um, and I can't make your penis bigger with an, in, with an internal pump. If I, if I could, there'd, there'd be a line out my door, I guarantee you. Um, I, I can only give you what you have, and we do, we do a very specific measurement in the operating room to size the device. Um, and if you have a 20 centimeter penis, I can put a 20 centimeter device in it. If I tried to put a 25 centimeter device in, uh, it would be like if you have a size 10 foot and I give you a size 6 shoe. You, you, you couldn't function that way. So infection and length related issues are important as far as the success rates of an internal pump and again the internal pump is a good option it's not a, it's it's not the perfect option it's it, it can be a very good option though so behavioral and lifestyle changes let me go back to that a second diet exercise stress reduction sleep habit, habits lifestyle changes yeah question the question is how does the internal pump work um, actually, there, there are three categories of the internal pump. One is the malleable device. The malleable device is essentially two cylinders that are placed in the penis. So they're firm all the time, and it just bends up and bends down. It's, it's easy, it's quick. It's really designed for somebody that doesn't have very good manual dexterity. Uh, they might have rheumatoid arthritis, they might be partial quadriplegic, something along, along those lines where they can't pump a pump. So it's quick and easy, you can put it in, it can, it can be effective, it's not my first choice. And if, if I look at the last 500 implants I've done, I've probably put three or four of those in. There's an intermediate two-piece device, and the two-piece device has cylinders in the penis and then a pump in the scrotum. And all you do is reach down and pump that pump, and that inflates the cylinders. That's also uh, a so-so implant in my mind. I'll put it in in some people if they've had certain types of complicated bladder surgery. But for the most part, I don't think it's a, a, a great option. I think it was originally designed, actually, um, for, for us, not for you. It was designed for us because then we didn't have to put the more complicated style device in, which I'll describe. And the two-piece device was a little bit easier to put in. So the company said, we'll make this two-piece device, the surgeons will put them in, and it'll be great. But they didn't really take into account you, which is a little backwards in my mind. Um, it's not a great device, and I don't use many of them at all. The, the best device is a three-piece device, and the three-piece device has cylinders in the penis, a pump in the scrotum, and a small reservoir filled with saline that's inside of you next to your bladder, actually. I can do that through a small one-inch incision in the scrotum. And again, it takes about 30 minutes. And what happens is that you, you reach down in the scrotum and grab the pump gently and, and, and squeeze the pump, and that just transmits the fluid from the reservoir into the cylinders, and you have an erection. It takes literally 30 seconds to inflate and, and probably about 10 seconds to deflate. Um, and that's the best internal pump, that, that, and it's the one that I put in most often. The question is, is that a little bulb? It is. It's a, it's a little pump, and it, it's a self-contained unit. So everything is closed, and when, when, when you're sitting there like you are, you're, you're, all the fluid is in your reservoir. And when you want to be intimate, you reach down and pump that pump, and it just pulls the fluid out of the reservoir into the cylinders. And if you were, if you were taking a shower in a gym or something like that, and people can't look at you and say, hey, you have an implant. It's completely discreet. So it's, it's really a very, very good option. 
Um, and again, success rate's very high. 90% of patients would recommend it to others or do, or do it again. How does it get back into the pump? I'm sorry, uh, it, well, there's a little button that you push. The question is, once you have an erection, how do you get the fluid out? You push a little button, and you give the penis a, g a gentle squeeze, and the fluid just goes right back into the reservoir. There's a little bit of a learning curve. When patients come in and, and learn how to use the pump, they're always nervous and anxious, but it's, most people can learn how to use it quickly. There's, a, again, a little bit of a learning curve, but for the most part, people, people can learn quickly. So getting back to behavioral and lifestyle changes, diet, exercise, stress reduction, sleep habits, lifestyle changes. And I, and I put this up again because this is important. It's lost on us as physicians, um, especially urologists. You know, our, our, our mindset is, what, what can we do to you? Um, and I'm being a little facetious, but um, we need to focus on these things. We need to focus on a healthy diet. We need to focus on, a, on, on exercise and stress reduction and good sleep habits and lifestyle changes, appropriate alcohol intake, um, stopping smoking, things like that. And we shouldn't just say, well, here's, here's some samples of Viagra, or here's your brochure for the internal pump. We should talk about this. This is, a, this is our commitment to you. Um, and really, when I look at it in my practice, I would say 15% of patients really make a solid commitment to, to, the, to diet, exercise, stress reduction, those types of things. It's difficult to do. It's difficult to make that commitment, but it's important. Um, and, and from my standpoint, I really think that, that behavioral lifestyle changes is the primary treatment in all patients with erectile dysfunction, with, 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 without question. So in review, what, what, what do we know? Erectile dysfunction, incredibly common. No two ways about it. A lot of people have it. People don't want to talk about it, or it's incumbent upon us to talk to you about it. It's really, really, you should talk to us about it as well. It's easily evaluated without a doubt. It's, it's, a, it's a history, it's a brief physical exam. There's not a lot of blood tests. There's, there's no x-rays. We can do those things, but they're not gonna really change things. It's relatively easily treated, and most of the treatments can be, can be very, very successful. Um, and, and what really do we need to know? We need to know that erectile dysfunction is a vascular disease. In the majority of patients with erectile dysfunction, the blood's not getting to the penis. And because of that, it doesn't get there. And if it does get there, say with Viagra or Levitra, it doesn't stay there. So it is a vascular disease, just like heart disease and heart attack and stroke and, and all the diseases that were talked about earlier by Dr. Greivar. So knowing, knowing that this is a vascular disease will potentially and can potentially save your life. And it's not just something that's up there to, to, to shock you. Um, again, the bottom line, it's common, it's underdiagnosed, it, it tip off to other significant uh, diseases and issues, easily diagnosed, easily treated, and might save your life. You know, about um, not, not that long ago, I had a guy that came in who had erectile dysfunction. He was a 50-year-old guy with diabetes. And uh, he was a healthy guy, um, took, took incredibly good care of himself. And he came to me because of erectile dysfunction. He had gone through Viagra, Levitra, Cialis, all of those medications. He tried the external pump. He even tried the injections. And he wanted one of the internal pumps. And um, we, we went through the evaluation, very straightforward. Um, as part of, part of his preoperative evaluation, we got an EKG. And the EKG was slightly abnormal. And we sort of, sort of thought about it, and I said, let's just have, the, have this primary care take a look at him. Primary care looked at him and said, well, let's send him to the cardiologist. Cardiology looked at him, sent him for a stress test that was remarkably abnormal. Later that day or the next day, he had a cardiac catheterization. And later that day or the next day, he went in for five-vessel bypass. So the only thing really, when you think about it, the only thing that got that guy to the cardiovascular surgeon was his complaint of erectile dysfunction. So when, when the title says erectile dysfunction could save your life, it could save your life. And talking to your physicians about it um, and doing the things I talked about, diet, exercise, lifestyle changes, those types of things can be incredibly important. So it's not a trivial lifestyle issue. It's something that can save your life. And, and no two ways about it. Question. Well, I, I, I think logically, um, diet and exercise, uh, easier said than done. Um, but 
giving these talks is, 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 is important as far as stressing those issues. You know, I, from my standpoint, um, you can come to me first if you have erectile dysfunction. And, and I'll, talk, I'll talk to you about that. Um, it, it's sort of up to you how you want to do things, I think. Um, I, I think letting the public know that diet and exercise are incredibly important is incredibly important. So the question is, is a high PSA a factor in ED? It could be. Well, uh, I would tell you um, that there, I don't, I don't look at PSAs as, as being uh, normal or abnormal. I look at change in PSA over, over time. So PSA in review, we get PSA blood tests to screen prostate cancer. That's the purpose of PSA the vast majority of the time. And so if you came into me with a PSA of one, uh, at how old are you? 73. 73. I, I'd be fairly content with that. And I would tell you that's normal. Um, but really what's important is where your PSA was before. Because if, on the flip side, if you came in with a PSA of eight, it would make a big difference if your PSA was always eight, or if last year your PSA was four, and the year before it was two. And prostate disease can be associated with erectile dysfunction. No two ways about it. So whenever I'm talking to patients about erectile dysfunction, I'm, I'm, making, I'm asking them questions about their or making notes about their PSA and their family history of prostate cancer, their voiding issues, things like that. So PSA is a, is a big can of worms. And it's gone through a lot of changes about its, its usefulness and how we should use it and when we should use it and if we should use it. But 28,000 men are going to die from prostate cancer this year. So it's a significant disease. So the, the question refers to nerve function and diabetes. And is there a difference between type 2 and type, type 1 and type 2 diabetes? So type 1 diabetes is not being uh, a, a smart uh, internist or family practice doctor or, or endocrinologist. I would tell you that, that uh, type 1 diabetes is something that, that, ha that has, has to, it occurs much earlier in life and is much more aggressive. And type 2 diabetes occurs a little bit later in life, but it's still a, a, a significant disease. From my standpoint, diabetics are going to have abnormal nerve function as it, as it pertains to erections. And a lot of that abnormal nerve function is irre irreversible. It, it, getting your sugars better isn't going to make those nerves better, in my mind. I, I don't see that. So that, that, that's kind of the, the simplistic answer to your a little bit more complicated question. Other questions? All right, thank you very much.